Welcome to this special long distance Lowy Institute event focused on the fall of Afghanistan and what this means for the United States and the world. I'm Michael Fullylove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. We've all been shocked at the speed with which the Taliban were able to capture Kabul and appalled at the images from Hamid Karzai International Airport in particular. I'm very pleased today to be speaking with two knowledgeable observers of both Afghanistan and Washington DC, Susan Glasser and Dr. Thomas Wright. We'll talk about what's happened over the past fortnight and what it means for Afghanistan, the Biden administration and the United States, and for the rest of us. Susan Glasser is a staff writer at The New Yorker, where she writes a weekly column on life in Washington. Among her previous positions, she was the Moscow bureau chief for the Washington Post, from where she reported on the last Afghanistan war. Susan is the co-author with her husband, Peter Baker, of The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. Dr. Thomas Wright is a colleague of mine from the Brookings Institution, where he serves as a senior fellow and director of the Center on the United States and Europe. He's also a non-resident fellow of the Lowy Institute, and in October last year, he wrote an influential paper for us about the 2020 US election titled, The Point of No Return. Tom is the co-author of a new book, Aftershocks, Pandemic Politics and the End of the Old International Order, which is out this week. Thank you to both of you, Susan and Tom, for joining us today from the United States. Thank, Thank you so much. All right, let me start with where we are today. Susan, this morning, President Biden gave a press conference in which he indicated he wouldn't be extending the withdrawal deadline beyond the 31st of August. Some of the Europeans are unhappy, but the Taliban have also refused to allow an, an extended withdrawal, describing this as a red line. So it looks like the nearly 20 year international commitment to Afghanistan will come to an end next week. How do you see things playing out between now and next Tuesday? Well, of course, Michael, there's a moment of real maximum peril, of course, at the very end of the end. First of all, there's now nearly 6,000 US military back who they had to surge back in to Afghanistan paradoxically uh, to secure the evacuation of the 2,500 troops who were there when President Biden made the decision back in April to end the US military presence in Afghanistan. So, you know, as basically what happened is that Kabul fell, uh, the government fell in a way and with a speed that had not been anticipated. As a result, they sent thousands of U.S. troops into Hamid Karzai International Airport to protect the airport in order to secure and to facilitate this extraordinary withdrawal. And by the way, it is an extraordinary withdrawal. The, the numbers that President Biden gave today were something like 70,000 uh, people total have been evacuated so far. Now, that includes uh, U.S. as well as allied uh, flights and charter flights that are going out of the airport, again, secured by the United States. It includes mostly Afghans, as well as citizens of the United States and citizens of other countries. Um, so it's a huge effort, uh, but I think there's enormous peril and risk in this final week, if that is what it turned out to be the final week. First of all, to get those uh, US military and military from other countries out of there safely. Uh, that has been the thing I think that really as bad as this is, I had a senior person in the Biden administration make the point to me, it's not the worst case scenario, as terrible as it is, because worst case would be that you start to have attacks on US personnel or US military, you start to suffer casualties. Look at the incredible outcry over Biden's leadership and imagine what that would be like uh, if there are actual successful attacks. And they've been warning in recent days with increasing uh, decibel levels of the possibility of a terrorist attack or ISIS in uh, Afghanistan targeting the airport. So it's, it's I think, a real worry what's going to happen. All right, Tom, what scenarios do you think are likely to play out in the next week or so? And in particular, what do you make of uh, this story that CIA Director Bill Burns has met with the Taliban leadership in recent uh, days? What does that mean for the dialogue between the United States and the Taliban? Yeah, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, so I guess this just picks up really where Susan left off. But, you know, Bill Burns's visit was sort of greeted in the press here as about the August 31st deadline and whether that could be extended. I, 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 I have no sort of 
inside information on this, but my guess is that that was uh, more about the security sort of situation that Susan has described. I mean, there has been, I think, considerable concern uh, over the last few days that there might be sort of an ISIS attack that they would sort of intervene um, really to, you know, just to sow sort of chaos, maybe shoot down a plane or just any anything really on the airport would shut down the evacuation. And I think that's a, a major concern. And I think that Taliban obviously clearly has a role there um, in, in preventing that. I mean, if that were to happen, it might happen with their acquiescence or, 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 or you know, uh, facilitated in some way by the security situation outside. So my suspicion is that that's what the visit was about, um, rather than um, necessarily extending the August 31st deadline. Um, I agree with Susan, it could be, you know, worse, uh, as bad as it is. Uh, and it is a, if not unprecedented, certainly an extremely large scale um, sort of evacuation. So I think that they, uh, the administration wants to make sure whatever mistakes have been made to this point, that they can actually execute this operation uh, with no uh, with no casualties, uh, no certainly no U.S. or or allied uh, casualties. All right. Let me come back a little bit later to um, the the nature of the evacuation and some sort of assessments of how um, the United States has gone. But let me let me stick with the next little while for a minute, if I can, Susan. There are. There have been anti-Taliban protests um, in different parts of Afghanistan, and we know there's some continuing resistance uh, in a number of locations, especially in the Panjshir Valley north of Kabul. Let me just ask you, is this definitely over now? Has the Taliban definitely won? We know that they have swept through with unprecedented speed, but is there a chance that this story has another twist? Or are we looking at uh, Taliban control of Afghanistan in, in the medium term? Well, Michael, you know, you're right uh, to, to be wary. Uh, this is Afghanistan, after all, war has been going on here since 1978. Uh, basically, not just one generation, but uh, essentially multiple generations of people. Uh, it's a very young country, after all. And it's um, a safe bet to say that uh, a civil war of some sort or another uh, is always a, a likely bet. And, you know, you're right to point out that the Panjshir Valley, that was the home of the Northern Alliance, the home of Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was the, the fabled uh, resistance leader, in fact, the uh, Che Guevara uh, of Afghanistan. He was killed, many people don't remember this, but in a precursor event to 9-11, two days before 9-11, he was killed by an Al-Qaeda operative disguised as a journalist in the Panjshir Valley. And that was really the signal to those who understood Afghanistan of momentous events that were to follow. Uh, of course, I was oblivious to this at the time as a Moscow correspondent for the Washington Post. But uh, to those people who had covered, uh, you know, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, they knew very well. Now, Ahmed Shah Massoud's son uh, has taken up uh, arms against the Taliban in Panjshir Valley and declared the resistance along with Amrullah Saleh, who was the first vice president of the um, now deposed Ghani government. And interestingly enough, he points out that the Afghan constitution, which you don't hear a lot about from the American officials who, by the way, insisted upon the passage of this Afghan constitution, this Afghan constitution actually would legally seem to put Amrul Saleh uh, as the uh, actual legal ruler of Afghanistan at the moment. But you know, we live in a, a world of geopolitics where, where might uh, determine who actually is in control of the country, not lawyers. Uh, but Saleh has joined with Ahmed Shah Massoud's son to begin the resistance anew in Panjshir Valley. And then there's the, the, the grassroots resistance around the country. I can't oversee to people enough. You know, this is not the Afghanistan of 20 years ago that I and other correspondents entered completely, you know, just astonished at the almost medieval scenes of, of poverty and isolation that we encountered. After 20 years, again, great waste, colossal fraud and abuse, uh, but also 20 years worth of education of girls and women, 20 years worth of integration with the world that had not existed in the previous 20 years. And so it's just a different country. And I do think that in cities around the country, that's why you've seen some of the grassroots protests with um, you know, people putting the Afghan national flag 
uh, you know, around their shoulders and, and, and defying Taliban fighters to, you know, parade around with it. This is a, this is a polarized society that is not yet reconciled to Taliban rule. Well, Susan, let me stay with you. You make the important point that Afghanistan has changed in the past 20 years. How much has the Taliban changed in the past 20 years? If you listen to their spokesman, um, there will be no revenge attacks against um, any Afghans who assisted Western forces. Women can um, retain some of their, their the gains they've made in the past 20 years and they can play a role in Afghan Afghanistan's life in accordance with Islamic war. Is this, is this just a PR strategy or have the Taliban also matured given that they are going to be dealing, as you say, with a, and trying to govern and rule a different Afghanistan? Well, you know, the, the advice I just gave someone before this uh, uh, conversation was you can save yourself some time and not read any story that begins with the headline, is this a different Taliban or, you know, is this a kinder, gentler Taliban? I think you can skip those stories. Uh, you know, the thing that worries me and the, the experts who, which is not me, but, you know, people who I, I know and respect who've spent their entire lives uh, following Afghanistan and the region, you know, what they've said to me in recent days, and I have asked about this, uh, is, no, it's not your father's Taliban, it's worse. Uh, and why? Because of technology, because uh, the tools that are available to a would-be autocratic, theocratic dictatorship, well, just look next door in China, which is already meeting with the leaders of the Taliban, which has welcomed uh, their return to power, uh, and the possibilities for an, a, an autocratic medieval Taliban enabled and empowered by technology, I think are truly chilling. And if you look at what's been done with the Uyghurs and the creation of a surveillance state in Central Asia. There is now precedent, there is now technology. I'm, I'm very worried about that. Uh, there are vast reams of data. These embassies were burning uh, information maybe about uh, you know, Afghan uh, passport holders who were applying for visas. But you know, I just read an article this afternoon that had me thinking, you know, there's piles of data that have been left behind, such as like the entire phone records of the Afghan telecommunication system. You want to know who's in contact with the Americans? You'll be able to find out in this new era of the Taliban. Tom, the administration has said that um, notwithstanding the fact that U.S. forces will be leaving Afghanistan, they are going to hold the Taliban to account for um, their treatment of uh, the Afghan people, in particular women and girls, and their approach to human rights. But how will they do this? What leverage will they have? I think, honestly, it's the leverage is pretty limited. Um, but I, I would just sort of pick up, I guess, to answer your question, Michael, just somewhere Susan left off. I, I don't, you know, I think it's very unlikely the Taliban has changed in any way. I think Susan is exactly right that maybe the best case scenario is a more sort of Iranian style, you know, regime in Afghanistan as bad and awful as that will be. Um, but I guess where I would just maybe add something is I, I think they do have some difficult governing choices to make, right? So uh, Susan mentioned China. Um, I mean, the Chinese are worried about the Taliban intervening, you know, in Xinjiang and providing support to uh, to, to separatists there. Um, there's a variety of other things that I think worries Beijing. You know, lots of Pakistan not very happy about uh, aspects of the Taliban's return to power. Then there's the Western dimension with sort of recognition or any type of, you know, economic uh, engagement. Um, so I think that they, you know, have their work cut out for them and trying to figure out what type of um, what type of government they want to have. And it's, you know, it's true that they have, uh, you know, a very advanced techno authoritarianism template that they can avail of. But, you know, that is also sort of difficult to pull off. I mean, Putin and she have really you know, worked very hard at perfecting that. And it's a it's a interesting combination of severe targeted repression, you know, with uh, attempts at least at delivering uh, certain things for parts of the populations of those countries. So I, I, I don't know how it will 
you know, play out. But my my sense is that, that you know, there really is from the US and European perspective, we should definitely not be counting on them having changed or them having sort of an awakening of sorts or even being responsive to pressure. But at the same time, they will have to sort of navigate this. And the, the final point is just so if you were going to come to it later or not, but just on the terrorism and Al Qaeda side, I mean, that's one of the big you know, questions. It's not really an issue mm -hmm. of whether or not they have learned and become enlightened. It's really a question of like the child putting their hand on the hot stove, you know, and getting burned if, if they've had that sort of learning and uh, knowing that, uh, you know, support for Al Qaeda or giving Al Qaeda or ISIS safe harbor in Afghanistan could lead to another US invasion if there was a future attack. So I think that's those are the sort of things, you know, I would look at you know, in terms of their sort of mm. incentive structure in a very sort of amoral, just cost benefit analysis from their perspective, rather than if they, you know, have, you know, come to terms that they're sort of a, you know, that maybe mm. they were wrong in the past, which I don't think mm. they have. And certainly and, the interviews they're giving would not suggest that. And just to follow up on that, Tom, um, if you saw uh, increased activity by by Al Qaeda or or uh, ISIS K or other terrorists attacking Western interests in the U.S. homeland from Afghanistan as a base. In other words, if the Taliban put their hand back on the hot stove, can you imagine circumstances in which President Biden would redeploy forces to Afghanistan, or are you looking more at airstrikes and other sorts of costs that would be exacted? Well, I think it it you know it it depends on the severity of the attack. Uh, I think certainly if there was anything approximating 9-11, yeah, I think at that point all bets are off and you know it would depend on the circumstances at the time. But I think any president would, you know, would would have all options on the table. And, you know, President Biden has always said, I mean, agree or disagree with the decision, you know, he said the counterterrorism aspect of this is is one that he remains committed to now there's a big debate as we know about whether or not that's practical in terms of how they're outlining it but certainly if that threat increased i i think they would be looking for sort of additional options so i think that's something they would need to be from their from their perspective you know that that's uh that would be a possibility if they allied with these groups the other point though is just that i think biden does make this point too is that um, you know, it's a different situation than before 9-11 because it's not just Afghanistan. You know, the ISIS is in a lot of different places. And so they have many different options in terms of, mm -hmm. and they've evolved in different ways. So this is clearly something to be very concerned about, but so is Syria, so is parts of Libya, you know, so it's a, it's a different world um, than it was 20 years ago. Susan, speaking of... Um... 20 years. I'd like to step back and ask both of you, but, but first you, Susan, whether or not you, are, a threshold question, do you agree with President Biden's decision to withdraw US forces from Afghanistan? Was that the right decision for the United States 20 years after they were first deployed? Well, you know, look, it's not for me, uh, you know, luckily as a journalist, right, you know, we get to criticize without having to be responsible. And it's a terrible responsibility. I think you know, there's broad support for a reason uh, across a deeply divided country right now, like the United States, there's almost nothing uh, that three quarters or two thirds of the country agrees upon. And two thirds of the country more or less does agree upon this. Why? Because it's very hard to argue after 20 years, uh, you know, that we've achieved any kind of lasting success. And, you know, what Biden and his uh, defenders have said, and I think they have a point is the swift collapse of the government in Kabul, if anything, might tend to underscore that we had been building on a foundation of sand and, you know, that there was not an edifice that was capable uh, of standing on its own here. And so, you know, again, I think that's one thing. What I've been really struck by and, and, and really disappointed by, I have to say, Michael, is that I've seen that this, this partisan divide in the United States uh, which now colors everything, as you know, from, you know, our public health response to the COVID crisis. And I hope we'll talk about Tom's fantastic new book a little bit. But, you know, our partisan divide is such that we are divided over mask wearing. Of course, we're divided over uh, Biden's foreign policy. Uh, and yet, 
what's amazing is that it seems to have stopped our ability even to have a meaningful, rational conversation in the middle of a crisis about how the administration is handling it or not handling it. Were they properly prepared? All indications are not uh, for the consequences of that pullout decision. Uh, was there a long enough horizon? Why did they not uh, understand that this scenario of a rapid collapse was one to plan more actively against? Uh, you know, and I will tell you, I'm not an expert on Afghan history, but there's a lot of Afghan history uh, that that uh, suggests a collapse like this is not unprecedented. Uh, the the opposing army has often chosen to melt away and to make deals when faced with an outcome that they think they can't change. In fact, that's exactly how the Americans walked into Kabul 20 years ago. They didn't fight a decisive battle with the Taliban at the gates of Kabul. The Taliban melted away because they knew they couldn't win. That's literally exactly what happened. So of course, there was precedent for what happened here. So again, for me, what I've really noticed the most in the last couple of weeks is we've you know, all been horrified and, 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 and really deeply, I think, troubled and saddened by uh, what's happened is that it's been exacerbated for me by the sense that here in the United States, we're so uh, divided uh, that, you know, Democrats, many Democrats for their part, they cannot stand the idea of criticism of Biden and the Biden administration, even when it comes to, I think, an important and legitimate set of questions about something they absolutely own, which is the decision on how to withdraw. And instead, you see a lot of people say, oh my gosh, it's George Bush's fault, it's Barack Obama's fault, it's Donald Trump's fault, all of which is true in many ways. You know, when you fail over 20 years, uh, you know, there are a lot of authors of that. And just two points I want to make relative to, to Tom's excellent points. There are a lot of authors of this and presidents Bush, Obama, Trump, as well as Biden are some of them. Another author of this though, it seems to me that has not been talked enough about is Pakistan. Because uh, to anyone who has followed the region, the, the, the terrible truth about this is that without Pakistan, there is no Taliban. Not only 20 years ago, there is no Taliban today and this would not be happening. And yet it's really remarkable. And it shows, I think, the death of serious, you know, kind of like reality-based policy conversation because we're so caught up in, uh, you know, this sort of American political drama, of which president, whatever. That's an important aspect of this tragedy for the Afghan people, but it's Afghanistan's neighbors, uh, as well as the people of Afghanistan as well, uh, you know, who are the authors of uh, this horrible tragedy that's playing out right now. And remember, it's not just a matter of the 300,000 estimated Afghans who helped or worked with Americans or supported in some way American organizations and allied and NATO organizations over the last two decades. That's a big number, 300,000. There's 38 million Afghans and millions of women and girls who are gonna suffer as a result of a collective failure of catastrophic proportions. And I, for one, it just really saddens me that we should reduce this into, oh my God, it's Trump's fault, or oh my God, it's Biden's fault. All right, Tom, let me ask you the same question. Um, you're a foreign policy scholar at the Brookings yeah, so Institution. I, I, so we, so I we, have we to give can, an answer. <laughs> we can demand an answer from you. Was President Biden right to withdraw forces after 20 years? And then perhaps you can also comment on some of the implementation difficulties that uh, Susan has mentioned in terms of executing that decision, whether it was an intelligence or the problems with intelligence or policy or military advice. Yeah, um, so I can tell you what I thought before, um, before all of this happened, which is I, I found it, because I was asked about it before and I thought it was an incredibly difficult, you know, genuinely sort of torn over it um, for exactly the reasons, you know, that Susan, described, I didn't, you know, foresee obviously exactly the way it unfolded, although I did think there was a chance when they wanted to pull out by July 4th that by September 11th, we could have had a Taliban Afghanistan again. So I think that was sort of a real possibility, but I, I did support the decision to withdraw. I mean, I do think my confidence level in that, I have to say, is, is modest, you know, because I think it's just such a difficult uh, a, a difficult sort of question. And um, even if it had gone smoothly, and I agree it could have gone, it definitely could have gone better, 
you know, there's no world in which there was not going to be a very high cost paid for that, right? And the question, uh, you know, is, I think, is, is the cost of it sort of worth it in terms of no longer sort of fighting sort of a very drawn out um, conflict that probably would have extended, you know, fairly indefinitely and probably at a higher level, you know, of troops. Um, so with that sort of cost and also the opportunity cost then as well of, of, of other threats and challenges. So for those reasons, you know, I, I would say I definitely sort of struggled with it, but I, for those, those reasons, I, I did um, support it. I think on the questions of implementation, look, I think nobody, and I'm sure, you know, in time when the administration reflects on this, I'm sure, you know, knowing what has happened, you know, obviously people, would, would adjust accordingly to, to the, the knowledge for sure um, that certain things turned out the way they did. I think they had a set of assumptions which were not crazy, you know, but they were not slam dunks either um, to do with the longevity of the government, believing they had time, uh, you know, uh, thinking they would be able to, you know, if they did make this decision early, it was over the objections of the of the Afghan government to kind of precipitated this very issue. Uh, obviously, the chance of that is better than you know the certainty of what has happened. But I think those were sort of assumptions that they that they believed and they operated accordingly. And those assumptions did not turn out to be true. And that's the nub of the problem. If you think of this in phases, I mean, the the first phase being the decision itself to withdraw. You know that second phase of the military withdrawal and background and all of that, and you know, leading up to here and and the phase we're currently in. I mean, clearly it was that second phase um, where those uh, assumptions were, were were mistaken, and then everything else sort of got baked into the cake. So I think that's you know why it you know why it happened, and they now obviously have an incredible, as we talked about earlier, just an incredibly difficult set of challenges. Um, that they need to, uh, you know, that they need to address. But I agree with Susan that for the administration, I think, you know, and I think for any anyone sort of being a, objective about it, that, you know, the reality, it seems to me, is as a non-Afghanistan expert, is that uh, the Taliban for a while has been much stronger, you know, than is generally appreciated. I mean, if they were able to move that fast and on that scale, whether or not it was fighting battles or simply having the organizational ability to buy everyone off and to 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 you know to ensure that they sort of melted away and to have allies in key places. I mean, that sort of tells me that they, you know, that that they would have been able to move, um, you know, against sort of you know if twenty five hundred American troops had stayed. So this was going to be more of a battle. Um, but many people, people I deeply respect, do believe, you know, that that would have been worth the cost. That uh, you know, five thousand troops uh, or whatever it took for an indefinite period is a is a price worth paying, and that that that's uh, you know that's a very fair point. Um, but that's the that's the other side of the argument. Susan, Tom talked about three phases. Let me ask you about the third phase that we're in now. Um, the, what, the administration is keen to talk about the success that the United States is having with the airlift. Uh, you mentioned the, 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 the figure of um, number of people who've been evacuated since the end of July. Today, the White House spokesperson said this is on track to be the largest airlift in US history. Uh, how impressive is that and how successful do you think the administration will be in shifting the debate onto that? I mean, could it could they uh, make lemonade out of lemons, if you like, and could could it, it look better in a week or two than it than it does at the moment? I, I mean, you know, that's that's what they're looking for. Uh, and again, I, you know, I, I find that to be almost a, probably a smart political argument, but almost a debilitating one. I find it to be really demoralizing, honestly, that we're you know having the White House press secretary Jen Psaki, who I, I really admire, and I think she's a very skilled uh, communicator. Talking about how this is, you know, an unqualified success when there's still so much to happen. When, by their own admission, they've only evacuated four thousand Americans, and they they themselves have said uh, that their estimate is there's as many as fifteen thousand Americans. Come on, how how is that an unqualified success? I mean, it's just, 
and again, I, you know, this is, it speaks to the political environment that we're in. No, I'm not ready to pronounce judgment one way or the other. I think it's incredibly impressive. Uh, and uh, it speaks to the enormous resources of the US military, its capacity. Uh, you know, there's no other country in the world uh, that could do this from frankly, a completely disorganized <laughs> and standing start. There are lots of tensions behind the scenes, I think, uh, between uh, the Pentagon and uh, the State Department. Um, you know, there's obviously, we have our broken and sclerotic immigration process. Uh, I don't, I'm really interested, uh, and I admit in somewhat of a personal way, in what happens to these people who were airlifting out of there. And if you'll notice, uh, there's not a lot of coverage of that. Uh, I've been scouring the coverage of it, looking for it, because mm -hmm. I've had behind the scenes this incredible personal drama in the last few days. My translator from uh, the Battle of Tora Bora back in 2001 resurfaced. Uh, I hadn't been in contact with him in recent years. He was a medical student at the time. He risked his life uh, to help me cover uh, this battle for the Washington Post. Um, he definitely uh, was, was a wonderful and brave person. He, he certainly probably saved my life. Uh, he, he went back to medical school. He became a doctor. He has six children. He owns a hospital in Jalalabad that was targeted by the Taliban in a battle last year because it was located next to a prison. So he's immediately on their hit list now that they've taken back over the city. He got in contact with me on Friday uh, and through a series of miracles, we were able uh, actually to get him and his family out even though they had not previously applied uh, you know, for a, a visa or a, any of these programs. What's amazing to me is that the Pentagon has a different interest here. They wanna put as many people on airplanes as possible. And it was very clear to me in trying to help this family, this one family in the midst of the horror of, of this war, the Pentagon folks said to me, you know, if you can get them inside the airport, we wanna put the people on the airplanes, you know? And I think that's an important insight for people to understand as they're trying to figure out what's happening here. The Pentagon doesn't want that number. That's a great number of 70,000. Absolutely, they wanna keep going. They want 100,000, they want 150,000. They wanna get the people on the airplanes. Okay, well now this family is in Qatar. I have no idea what's gonna to happen to him. Uh, Joe Biden said today, and he's correct, that his predecessor, Donald Trump, broke uh, you know, the American asylum system that had existed. That's part of the reason why they seem to have been so disorganized. No applications were processed. There were 10, a backlog of something like 20,000 for this special immigrant visas. So I'm very, very skeptical uh, about what kind of success it's gonna be. How long are these people gonna languish in camps? What are we gonna do with them? How quickly are the Republicans who have been castigating in a very hypocritical way, Joe Biden for the botched rescue effort, how quickly are they gonna say, oh, those people we rescued no, we don't actually want them to come mm -hmm. to America. Uh, you know, if the past is any guide, very quickly indeed. Thank you for telling us that story, which reminds us of the, the sort of the human cost of these huge political decisions. And congratulations um, for the success you seem to have had. Um, it, it reminds me um, what, a useful, uh, what a useful friend you are to have, Susan. I'm gonna keep that in mind if I ever get into any difficulties. I want to be clear like it was actually a miracle and really like it was just complete dumb fate you know that this guy actually i wasn't in contact with him he put a twitter message i wasn't even of course following him on twitter i happened to see it i piggybacked off the hard work of some colleagues at Condé Nast who were already organizing a rescue of people who had spent years working for uh, you know, journalists and had raised the money for a whole separate, you know, rescue operation. So it was literally a reminder that in war, sometimes the fate is like, if you, you know, what list you end up on. I mean, you know, you are a student of American history. I, I've read a million books about World War II. This week for me was like, the list is everything, uh, you know, and the random connection at the random moment is everything. Uh, so mm. it truly wasn't me as much as it was as sort of strokes of luck and also some colleagues who were really amazing, actually. Still, it's a lovely sliver of, of hope um, to hear about. Let me go from that hope back to the grubby world of politics. 
Um, you mentioned earlier tensions between the State Department and the Pentagon. Just give us a, a, an overview of, of um, the feeling within the administration. What's the morale within the White House? What are the tensions between the White House and the State Department and the Pentagon? Is the team sticking together? Uh, are they throwing rocks at each other? Um, how, how is the Biden administration weathering this storm? Well, I'm, I'm eager to hear what Tom has to say on this. I mean, I can definitely say uh, that there is very notable tension uh, between the Pentagon and the State Department uh, that I have seen. Uh, and, uh, you know, they reflect the very different resources and, and composition of those institutions. Uh, when the military wants to surge people, they have a hell of a lot more people <laughs> uh, to surge than, than, than our civilian bureaucracy. And that, that's certainly part of it. Uh, I think maybe there's a feeling that, that the State Department planning was, was not as far along uh, or as, as robust or, or useful as, as that of the Pentagon, which really does know how to do evacuations like this, even if it doesn't look pretty. But again, there's such a disparity between resources. So yeah, a lot of finger pointing. Uh, we started to see some, you know, knives come out for some of the senior officials like Jake Sullivan, the, the national security advisor here. I, I think Biden uh, won't abide by that, uh, my guess is, because uh, unless there's an even bigger debacle, because frankly, it's Joe Biden who is accountable for this decision. And I think everybody in Washington knows that this was his personal call over the objections and the instincts, uh, uh, almost certainly probably including uh, Jake Sullivan, his national security advisor, and certainly overruling his, his Pentagon leadership. And so, you know, I, I think people understand that the person who made this call and in, in some ways is responsible for this debacle of the, the evacuation was, was Joe Biden. All right, Tom, let me give you the opportunity to weigh into that if you like, and also ask you about um, how President Biden's instincts will manifest in the next set of foreign policy decisions he makes. And what I mean by that is uh, it's clear that he wants the United States to do less in the Middle East. Does that mean that the, does this free the United States up to do more in other parts of the world, including in Asia? We know a lot of people around President Biden uh, want this. Does President Biden want that? Is that his vision that he can do more in other parts of the world? Or uh, is the, the pivot for President Biden really more of a pivot back towards the homeland? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Just, uh, just to follow on on Susan's point, I mean, I think she makes a really key point that, you know, this decision was a presidential level decision from the beginning. Um, and it was because, you know, Joe Biden has believed this for a very long time. Uh, I mean, reportedly believes that the US should have gotten out after killing bin Laden in 2011. He argued, uh, you know, against the surge in Afghanistan during, you know, the Obama administration. You know, he basically has always believed that the US ought to have a more narrow counterterrorism mission and that the costs of long-term military engagement were far too Hi, and I think this is something in his decisions about who to appoint when he appointed General Austin, you know, to this to the position of Secretary of Defense. That was one of the reasons, you know, why he appointed him because he believed that you know they sort of saw eye to eye on on this issue and 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 some others. And so, I think that that makes it a different type of um, of, of situation than where you might have an inexperienced president who is sort of hoodwinked by advisors with their own agendas, you know, then mm -hmm. finds themselves, you know, like Kennedy and the Bay of Pigs, finds themselves in a situation they didn't sort of anticipate or didn't want to be in. Um, this is something, you know, that Joe Biden, I think for, as I was saying earlier, I think for legitimate and good reasons, you know, wanted to do. And I think there was always going to be, you know, significant, you know, bureaucratic push against that because for lots of sort of obvious reasons. And, and I think that that's something he was sort of determined to push through. Now, the, the, the controversial part obviously is the implementation. And I, I think we just, I certainly don't know enough, you know, at this point as to why that happened in the way it did. I think we need to learn a lot more um, in, before we sort of attribute 
sort of blame or responsibility in terms of those decisions, you know, that were made and what the other, you know, options were. But I think he, and especially given the way it's sort of functioning now, I mean, he's been pretty clear, you know, that he has confidence, you know, in his team. And I don't think that that is going to change absent some major, you know, development that hasn't sort of occurred yet. I think the question, second question you ask about the impact, I think is a really important one because already, you know, we see the Global Times in China and other sort of, you know, organs of the Chinese state say, you know, this shows the US, you know, doesn't care about Taiwan or, you know, the Russians making hay over it. And even in Europe, calling into question the credibility. Um, I, I think that is absolutely just analytically wrong about where Biden is. You know, I think for him, Afghanistan is pretty sui generis. Like he, he wants to leave Afghanistan because he disagrees with the continued, you know, prosecution of the war in Afghanistan. I mean, he's been very clear on that. He is, it's not like you might say if Bernie Sanders was president and he made this decision that it had a consequence for all sorts of other commitments where President Sanders would have been ambiguous or may not have made up his mind. Uh, and in fact, in one of his speeches, so I think it was last Monday, so about nine days ago, uh, when uh, President Biden was speaking, he actually specifically said, you know, in order to focus on the threats of 2021 and not the threats of 20 years ago, you know, this is why I'm doing it. Now, one can disagree with him on that and argue that, you know, terrorism is still a very pressing threat today. Uh, but I think he does basically believe you know, that the threats of today and tomorrow come from, uh, you know, major powers, they come from the threats to democracy. I mean, he's spoken about this a lot. And so I think it is actually, again, agree or disagree with the decision. I think it's consistent with his, you know, if you want to call it a doctrine, I think it's consistent with his doctrine, it's consistent with his worldview, for better or worse. And I think that they uh, are, have absolutely no intention of sort of pulling back or, you know, retrenching from other commitments. And I think it may be the contrary. If other actors press them and test them on that because they believe that they are irresolute, I think it will just ensure that they actually are even more resolute and sort of stand up there. And that it could be a problem, right? I mean, just in, in the way that plays out, if other actors make that calculation, we might be in for some rocky, times. And I think that's why you will see from the administration, I, I expect, sort of a pretty clear message, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, with Vice President Harris's trip to Asia this week and, and, and in Europe and elsewhere, you know, that that, that would be a miscalculation by others if they were to conclude that. Susan, let me ask you a question about the same kind of topic. One of our audience members, Ian Kennedy, asks what all this means for China. And I guess the question is, should a country like China be pleased that America looks weak at the moment, or should it be worried that America will try to show its strength um, somewhere else in the world, perhaps in Asia? You've observed the, the sort of the back and forth of US foreign policy over, over many years. There is a pattern sometimes where um, the United States uh, sort of reacts to, to a particular perception of itself or it, it the, the the, 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 the tenor of its engagement with the world toggles sometimes. Um, what's your sense of, of where the administration's head is? Where will, what will, will they be looking to show strength um, in other parts of the world? No. Uh, you know, I, I know that's a sort of flip answer, but I, if you want to know where the administration is toggling to, look at Joe Biden's speech today, four hours delayed. It was supposed to be a speech on Afghanistan after an emergency meeting of the G7 with the allies to talk about what to do. What did he talk about? Instead, he began the Afghanistan speech four hours after it was supposed to begin by talking about an incremental vote on his bipartisan infrastructure deal uh, in the House of Representatives on Capitol Hill. Joe Biden's uh, foreign policy right now is not what's driving him, uh, despite his years of experience and interest in the world and his genuine commitment to some of the things that Tom's talking about. This is an inward looking moment at the United States. Uh, and uh, Biden 
uh, has an enormous, enormous struggle at home. The crisis of democracy that he's concerned about is the crisis of democracy inside the United States. And, and I, I frankly, I find that, you know, that's part of what's been so painful uh, about listening to some of the administration's rhetoric in the last couple of weeks, because, you know, yeah, sure, you know, they say, well, we, America's back in the world and we care about our allies. And, you know, Joe Biden, without, in that same speech that Tom cited, without any sense of irony whatsoever, said, we need to put human rights and democracy at the center of our foreign policy. Well, what about the human rights of these Afghan women that we're walking away from because we wouldn't keep 2,500 soldiers there who didn't suffer any casualties for 14 months. 70 years, we've kept 25,000 soldiers in South Korea. So, you know, I know that this has been caricatured as if like, you know, it's like hawkish, like commentators, like endorsing the forever war, whatever. I'm not in favor of war or against the war. Those are policy decisions. I don't envy the people who've had to make them, but. You know, I think there's been a lot of dishonesty uh, and uh, moral smugness from Democrats. Uh, you know, I, I've known being in Washington for a long time that, uh, you know, you make a mistake if you assume that, um, you know, sort of hy hypocrisy is only the preserve of the other side. Uh, you know, all uh, politicians, whatever their ideology, tend to be opportunistic in the face of the very real challenges that are thrown at them when they're in office. So, you know, I, it's understandable to me, uh, but um, I would be very, very careful to anybody who thinks that Joe Biden's foreign policy is uh, based on a doctrine of promoting democracy and human rights around the world. I don't see that happening. I don't see them, uh, you know, overcorrecting and uh, uh, getting into provocative confrontations with China at the moment, uh, not at all. I think that there is a genuine uh, and very smart and strategic approach to the challenge of a long-term competition with China. I think that uh, you know, they have made some moves uh, that are very interesting in that regard, but the primary analysis and critique that the Biden team has had of foreign policy in the last few years, right, has to do with the uh, almost willful uh, flouting of alliances and partnerships by the Trump administration, which they believe are necessary uh, to engage in a long-term confrontation with China and Russia and uh, great, other great powers. And yet, take that Afghanistan template. Um, sure, the public words are, we want to stay on the same team, you know, alliances matter. Uh, ask our European allies, Tom knows this uh, better than I do. They don't feel that they were adequately consulted either about Joe Biden's decision to withdraw in April or about the way that it's been handled ever since. And in fact, behind the scenes, they were pleading with him for more time than this August 31 self-imposed deadline to get their people out. So, uh, you know, there was one European quote in the Times I noticed uh, just yesterday saying, you know, this is not, this is more um, uh, policy by diktat than it is uh, consultation with the allies. And so what does that tell you about this approach toward China that's supposedly gonna be based on reinvigorating American alliances. Again, I would just be skeptical about creating overly um, broad conclusions from this particular uh, very sad episode. Just, I don't really disagree with Susan, but just maybe a couple of points of divergence. I mean, I think that, I don't think they're gonna set out and try to overcorrect somewhere else, right? The point I was making is that if other countries conclude from this, you know, that they would also, you know, disengage from Taiwan in a crisis or in the indo yeah, I agree with Europe, that. Then they are making a mistake. And I think the administration will not, you know, do that. And so I think th they will probably try to send signals just to disabuse China, Russia and others of any general conclusions. And I wouldn't have necessarily thought there were other countries were going to do this, except the the language coming out of Chinese state media in the past sort of week, 10 days has been a little bit alarming in terms of drawing very explicit conclusions for Taiwan, uh, which I think are not there. Um, I also agree that I think, you know, there's a, there's a tension probably between the political imperative, which is, you know, try to be sunny, optimistic, put the best sort of spin on something versus you know, the, the fact that this is an incredibly, you know, sad situation that even if you agree with the decision, there's an enormous trade-off and cost to it. 
And the best approach, in my opinion, is just strategic frankness about that and is not to try to sugarcoat it or, or, or say that it doesn't you know, exist. And I think the allies point, you know, I think especially in Europe, what this should underscore is they, they got to talk about the important things now. You know, they have to talk about their differences. And, you know, I felt on the June trip to Europe, you know, it was a successful trip, but it was largely sort of a sugar high of, you know, we're back, we're returning and Europeans and that's great, it's terrific. And if you talk to both the administration and to the European allies, Privately, they would be frank that, oh, there are issues here, but those weren't sort of addressed in the trip, right? So I think what we need to do at future summits and meetings is really have a frank conversation with Europe in particular about trying to ensure that they are more capable and autonomous to deal with problems when their interests are more threatened by certain challenges than maybe the US's interests are. And that's been a long running thing, but no administration has really embraced the notion of European sort of strategic capability and independence, whatever we call it. And I think that may be something, you know, that the Biden administration will have to look at pretty, pretty closely in, in coming months, because I think there will be, you know, there, 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 this will have an effect. This is a big event, obviously, and, you know, will affect the transatlantic relationship. Susan, obviously one of the challenges that European leaders worry about is Russia. You're a long-time observer of Vladimir Putin. Um, how would Putin and the Kremlin feel about developments in the last couple of weeks? Obviously, in the last couple of years, they've, they've returned to the Middle East with a vengeance. We now see them um, starting to play a bit of a, a power broker role, perhaps, in Afghanistan. What does this mean for Russia's behaviour internationally? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, Russia, as you know, fought its own version of, you know, Vietnam, essentially, in Afghanistan uh, throughout the 1980s, uh, but has always seen uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia essentially as a part of its extended neighborhood. Uh, it's not the Middle East to Russia. It's, you know, Central Asia is literally its own backyard. And, uh, you know, there have been increasing evidence, really, in the last few years of Russian uh, you know, sort of ill will and, and acting against American troops on the ground. Remember, there was the, the issue of the Russian bounties that were allegedly, uh, you know, paid to, to fighters in Afghanistan. That was a piece of intelligence much disputed in the 2020 election and the question of whether or not former President Trump took that seriously. Uh, you know, regardless of that particular issue, right, it's clear uh, that uh, Russia views geopolitics in a very zero sum way still when it comes to the United States. And that is to say, when the US uh, loses and uh, suffers an embarrassment like this, Russia sees that quite simply to its benefit. Uh, Vladimir Putin was very quick in the aftermath of the um, unhasty fall, hasty fall of the Ghani government to say, there will be no deals uh, with the Central Asian countries to base uh, you know, US forces there, even temporarily, even for counterterrorism fighting. Uh, after 9-11 is when I was based in Moscow as a correspondent. And um, it was really a kind of shocking development for many in the region that Putin, uh, who was early in his tenure, acquiesced to an American presence uh, at bases. Uh, and that wasn't entirely his say. Those are independent countries of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Uh, and uh, Kyrgyzstan, some of the countries that, that are nearby or neighboring to Afghanistan. And there were US forces there. There was something called the Northern Distribution Network that was negotiated painstakingly during the Obama administration to get supplies into um, uh, the government in Afghanistan. Putin essentially has shut that off on the front end uh, and really laid it down in a way that makes very clear uh, you know, that he sees uh, himself and Russia as being the only beneficiaries here of this sudden shift in regional power. All right, we're almost out of time. I want to give you the final question, Tom, because as I mentioned, you have a new book out this week on COVID. Uh, unfortunately for you, this is the first week in the past 18 months where COVID has not been the biggest news story in the world. So we want to do our bit by giving you an opportunity to speak about some of the themes in the book. When President Biden defended his withdrawal, he said this, I'm adamant 
that we focus on the threats we face today in 2021, not yesterday's threats. In your new book, you say the pandemic marked the end of the post 9-11 moment in foreign policy. So what era are we entering and what will it mean for America's global role? Thanks, uh, Michael. It's very kind of you to mention it. Yeah, it's a tough uh, news week to, to launch a book on COVID, but I'm sure it will uh, come back in the in the weeks and months ahead, unfortunately. Um, the book is, you know, it's about this extraordinary moment where we had a global crisis in an age of nationalist governments, geopolitical rivalry, but no international leadership, when many world leaders didn't even speak to each other, um, and how that sort of turned out. You know, it is a glimpse into you know our very recent past but also possibly our future as we face crises from transnational threats like climate change future pandemics and uh, other you know challenges and really there's no cooperation no g7 moment no g20 moment um so we try to tell the story of that we talk to a lot of officials try to sort of tell some of the untold stories from that period but i think to your question in terms of where we're headed I think what the pandemic really shows is that the major powers are just not on the same page, even when it comes to threats that they share in common, and that we should try in the future to work with China, work with Russia, work with others on these challenges. But we also need a backup plan, you know, if that cooperation does not uh, come to fruition, uh, because we are in a world really where we have you know, near worst case scenarios on transnational threats like climate and pandemics and on great power competition simultaneously. And so we have to prepare to deal with those transnational threats with the world that we have, right? Which is a world beset by sort of nationalism and rivalry uh, and possibly more in the future, depending on what happens here um, politically. And that I think is a challenge that, you know, President Biden has and that other world leaders, including obviously in Australia, uh, have as well. Well, thanks for finishing with the worst case scenarios. I must say the best case scenario for me is having both you guys uh, on the screen to help explain what's happening uh, to us. So thank you very much, Susan Glasser and Tom Wright, for joining me today from the United States. I've learned a lot and I'm really grateful for your time. Thank you, Michael. It was great to be here. Thanks so much, Michael. It's wonderful to be with both of you. In the coming weeks, the Institute will continue to explore these issues and will mark some forthcoming anniversaries, including the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and the 70th anniversary of ANZUS. Let me also put in a plug for my podcast, The Director's Chair. I'm pleased to say my guests on the next two episodes of The Director's Chair will be former Australian Prime Ministers who both prosecuted the war in Afghanistan, Julia Gillard and John Howard. So thank you again, Susan and Tom, for joining me. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today for this long distance Lowy Institute event.